respect to other people. I didn't say he's the greatest coach. I said he's the greatest individual. He's doing more for the college athlete than any coach I have ever known, more even than I did probably, insofar as not only football but other things, getting him ready for life. Curry's a great individual. He, he is really an asset to college football, and we love him. He's not going to have great records. He's not going to have lead molds. He's not going to win the national championship. But we need more Bill Curry's coaching college football today. I don't think he'll have as good a team this year as he had last year because, strangely enough, two or three good individual football players can change a mediocre team into a good team, and that's what we had last year. Our quarterback, John Dewberry, brought our offensive team up to be a good offensive team. Ted Roof and two or three of the defensive players turned our defensive team into a good defensive team. And we won more games than I ever thought we could possibly win. Before the season opened last year, at about this time exactly, I talked to Tech Alumni Club, and they would say, Coach, how are we going to do this year? And I said, if Curry wins six and loses five, that's fine. If he wins seven, I'll vote him coach of the year. If he wins eight, we'll change the name of Grant Field to Bill Curry's Field. I didn't even mention nine, and Curry won nine. There's no way he could have won nine last year. There's no way he could win the bowl game against Michigan State after losing his key football player. But he did. I'm so proud of Bill. Team this year will not be quite as strong because of the loss of key men. Not all of them, but he lost some key football players. If he wins seven and loses four, it's great. If he loses, it, wins six, that's fine with me. As for you dogs, you've got a good football coach and you get good football material at Georgia. And those two things make winners. I would say that Georgia may be the most underrated team in the country today because they have got good football players that are backed up over there. And they've got good men at key positions and they have good coaching staff. I would say that Georgia will win nine or ten football games, go to a major bowl. So we're all gonna, gonna see good football, and we're very fortunate in having good people running our football program. Now I want to give you all a three-minute coaching lesson that I usually give for two two hours to coaches. I, I, I give Curry, I gave Dan Henning, the Falcon football coach, this lecture because Men, I've been playing football and coaching it since 19 and 21. And as I tell people, if I don't know football, I'm stupid. And I ain't stupid. So, I want to tell you what I told them. And I can give it to you all in three minutes because you all are smarter than those football coaches, see. I'll tell you how to be a good football coach. Well, first, if you want to be a great coach, you try to get to a state university not a school that's not a state university. You don't want to be coaching Mississippi State, Tulane, Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, Wake Forest. You want to be at a state university because they have the advantage of recruiting. They can get better boys because of the courses and getting them in school and the family background. Their mother went there, their sister went there. So if you can, get a job at a state university. Second thing is you've got to have enough intelligence to pick good assistant coaches. No football coach today in the, in the country is a good coach, successful coach, if he doesn't have good assistance on him because they do the coaching. He coaches the coaches, he's the motivator, he's the leader, but the coaches coach the football player. And you've got to have good assistance. That, that's the one thing, you've got to have enough intelligence. Then you've pretty well got it made. If you're at a state university and you've got good assistance, you've got it made. Now then I want to tell you the three things that football coaches, many of them underrate, and they don't do a good job of it. And if you will do these, coach it, and you can coach these phases, you will be a winner. You will whip that other guy on all the close games. The first is penalties. Football coaches, particularly college, a pro football coach, do not seem to realize that penalties are breaking their back, costing them football games. You see, how many times do you see the pros line up and that quarterback drops back and throws a 40-yard touchdown pass? Flag down. Holding. That one play can cost him the football game. But that's not just the one play. That punt returner catches a punt and runs back 50 yards. Flag down. Clipping. And you'll see in the statistics the next day, the Falcons are penalized five times for a total of 60 yards. It wasn't 60 yards. 
They had a 40-yard touchdown pass. They had a 50-yard punt return. They had many plays called back. You put those in the statistics, and it doesn't look that way. It's five penalties and 200 yards, and you can't win doing that. As an example, just let me tell you one example. I, did, I told Dan Henning this because I found out that I tried to recruit Dan Henning. I didn't try to recruit him hard because he's a New Yorker and I didn't know enough about him. But I offered him part scholarship and he ended up getting the full scholarship at William & Mary, so he didn't come to me. But he played the Bellis Series, Mark. That was what his high school coach believed in. And they played Georgia Tech system and he felt like he knew Georgia Tech. So anyway, I met Dan. I didn't, didn't know him until this year. I didn't want to know him last year. He was a terrible team. And, 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 and I gave him this coaching lecture. And I said, Dan, you have got to get penalized less than that other team. I said, I'm the least penalized team in the United States every year at Georgia Tech. And everybody, of course, thought the officials were my relatives. They weren't my relatives. <laughs> we did it because we stressed it more. We brainwashed our players. We can't win if you're, if you're holding and we run a long run for touchdown. You can't win. So we're, we're, we're not penalized. I told Curry about this. Two, three years ago. Since then, he has been the least penalized team in the ACC twice and the second in the ACC the other time. And that's why Curry is doing better. So I talked to Henning about this. And I'd be damned if the Falcons didn't go out here to play their first exhibition game against the Giants out here at the stadium. And I, I'm, I'm watching the game, listening to it. First series of downs, Falcons got the ball on their own 20-yard line, which is normal. They line up and run two plays, and they got third and seven. Typical Falcon team. He, drop, he drops back, Archer did, and he hit that flanker. Perfect throw, Marvin. Perfect throw right in his hand. 40 yards. Boy, we're backing down in that team's territory. Flags down. Number 78's holding. So the play is called back, and Falcons are back on the 11 yard line now. Third down and big yardage to go instead of in the other team's territory, first down. That one play can beat you. But two series of downs later, the Falcons come up fourth down. And this Falcon kicker, he boomed one a mile. 53 yards, no run back. Put the other team back on their goal line, which is where you want them. Flag down. Number 79 left too soon. Call it back, penalize it. Plays like that, just two or three of those plays. Is the difference in winning football games and losing them. Penalties, get penalized less than that other team. Brainwash your team that we're not going to get penalized. Have officials out there to coach your boy. This is illegal. This is legal. We did it better than anybody. And you watch a, a team that is penalized and you see them jumping offside and you see them running into the kicker and you see them, you just put it down. That's a poorly coached football team. That's the way I judge football coaches. That's the way I judge football teams. Penalties, that's, that's the most important. The second thing is turnovers. If your quarterback is throwing that ball to that other team, you take him to the eye doctor. And if he's not colorblind, you sell him. Because he better be colorblind. Turnovers. You can't afford to throw that ball to the other team. Incomplete passes don't hurt you much. But interceptions will beat you. You don't turn that ball over to that other team. And pros do it all the time. And a lot of coaches, college coaches, have copied the pros and they're throwing from their own 10 yard line. And they're getting beat. I'm about to run over my time. I, I, I'll end this by saying the third thing, and I won't, won't elaborate on it, is kicking game. Nalen, my coach at Tennessee, is one of the great kickers of all time, to, uh, coaches to cover the kicking game. We at Tech played the kicking game better than anybody. We won on the kicking game. We did all phases, you know. They're all phases of kicking game. Rushing the other team, running back punts, blocking kicks, everything. We did it better than anybody. Those three things, you coach better than the other team, and you do what I told you, and you could be a successful football coach. I had a couple other things to give you, but I, I, I'm about to run over time, and I'll end my talk with a story about the first football game my grandpappy ever saw me play, and he went back to the mountains, tell my mountain people what it looked like, and this is the way he described the game. He says, I went down there to that there city of Knoxville. Never saw so many people running around. Looked like the county fair was in town. Said they shoved me through a gate, pushed me, knocked me. I'm sitting up in the clouds. Everybody betting five, betting 10. And then he says, a bunch of little old girls come running out. 
all dressed up in short skirts, he ought to be ashamed of himself. Said he got right down there in front of everybody and jumped up and screamed, volunteers, volunteers. Said he went down there and volunteered and they said, get the hell back up there and sit down. <laughs> and he said, said about that, about that time, he said some little old fellas coming out in striped pants and striped shirts. They had a whistle and they tooted it. And then he says a bunch of little old fellas come running out from a hole in the ground. All dressed up in orange. Orange goads on the head. And then he says a bunch of little old fellas come running out from that other side. They all dressed up in blue. They got blue goads on their head. And they all got down in that grass and everybody looked mad at each other. And then he said the littlest one there run right up and smell of the biggest one. The damnedest dog fight broke out you ever did see. <laughs> May, may the Lord bless you.